Columbus dug his toes into the sand of Hispaniola on December 6, 1492. The island was screwed. The Taino people welcomed him when he first showed up. No problem. But that didn't last. Columbus's journal tells you a lot about what he was thinking. He described the Taino as good and intelligent servants and figured they'd be easy to convert to Christianity since, as far as he was concerned, they didn't have a religion. He didn't see them as equals at all, just people he could use. Things unraveled pretty quickly, though. His main ship, the Santa Maria, ran aground, so Columbus had to leave some of his men behind at their first settlement, La Navidad. When he came back in 1493, things had turned sour. He found out the Taino had killed everyone, and Columbus was furious. He wasn't about to let that slide, so he went after them hard. This was the start of the forced labor and the slavery and the violence that would wipe out most of the indigenous population. The thing was, Columbus wasn't there to make friends. He was after gold and resources. His whole approach to the Taino was based on domination and not partnership. He saw them as tools to get what he wanted. The dynamic between the Europeans and the native people was already breaking down. And from that point on, the island was on a path that would change it forever. When Columbus came back to Hispaniola in 1493, things had gone south fast. That settlement that he left at Navidad? Gone. All 39 of his men were dead. The Taino, led by Chief Cahuanabo, had wiped them out, probably in response to the way the Spanish had treated them. Columbus didn't waste any time planning his revenge, but while he was focused on payback, he couldn't ignore what had drawn him to the island in the first place. Gold. The massacre didn't slow him down. By January 1494, Columbus had already established a new settlement called La Isabela, this time on the northern coast of what's now the Dominican Republic. This wasn't some temporary outpost like Navidad. La Isabela was fortified with a strong military presence, but even as he built it, Columbus's eyes were on the Sabao Mountains. The Taino had been finding gold in the rivers, and he wanted all of it. Columbus sent Alonso de Ojeda and 15 men to track down the source of that gold. After slogging through thick forests for six days, they hit pay dirt. The Taino were already sifting gold from the streams, and this discovery kicked off a whole new level of exploitation. Columbus wasted no time. By March 12, 1494, he was in Sabao, and he immediately started building a fort, Fort Santo Tomas. This was the stronghold the Spanish needed to tighten their grip on the island's gold. The hunger for gold only grew. Columbus left 56 men at Fort Santo Tomas under the command of Pedro Marguerite to keep the extraction going. Meanwhile, he turned his attention back to Cahuanabo, the chief who had massacred the men in Navidad. With the help of his Taino ally, Guancaca Nagarix, Columbus waged a brutal campaign of revenge. By March 24, 1495, he had captured Cahuanabo and his family, but not before killing and enslaving countless Taino. Then came the real exploitation. Columbus forced every Taino over the age of 14 to pay a large hawk's bill full of gold dust every three months. Those who couldn't pay faced severe punishment. The Spanish were convinced there was far more gold on the island than the Taino were finding, and they pushed the forced labor system harder. This brutal system led to immense suffering and laid the foundation for the encomienda system, a cruel, long-lasting regime of exploitation that would shape Spanish colonization for decades to come. By the early 1600s, the western and northern coast of Hispaniola had basically turned into a pirate playground. Tortuga was at the center of it all. Tortuga is a small, rocky island off the northwest coast of Hispaniola. It was a perfect spot for pirates from all over, mostly French, English, and Dutch. From there, they basically had free reign and could take advantage of Spain's shaky grip on the island. Tortuga was remote. There were tricky tides that made it hard to get to. It was the perfect base to make raids from. The Spanish did try to fight back. In 1629, Don Fadrique de Toledo led an effort to kick the pirates out, and for a while it worked. But pirates are persistent. By 1630, French and English buccaneers had snuck back onto the island. Tortuga was right back in pirate hands, and over the next few decades, the Spanish and pirates duked it out, and it was the pirates who usually got the best of the Spanish. The French made a big move in 1640 by capturing Fort Rocher, a key spot on Tortuga. They fortified it, turning the island into a pirate stronghold that ran more on a loose code of buccaneer justice than any real European laws. Under the protection of Fort Rocher, the pirates turned Tortuga into a lawless haven, launching attacks on Spanish ships and settlements all over the Caribbean. One of the most famous figures to come out of this pirate scene was Henry Morgan, a Welsh privateer working for the English. Morgan was ruthless and Morgan was smart. He used Tortuga as a launching pad for some of his biggest raids on Spanish territories. 
he pulled together a fleet of buccaneers and made Tortuga the heart of their operations. But Morgan was just one of many. Tortuga was home to a wild mix of pirates, each with their own allegiances and agendas. The politics of the time were a mess. Pirates like Morgan were often hired by governments, usually the French or English, to attack Spain. Officially, this made them privateers, but the line between pirate and privateer was almost non-existent. These guys switched sides whenever it suited them, and loyalty was a rare thing. By 1660, the English had briefly taken over Tortuga, but they quickly handed it back to the French. In 1665, under King Louis XIV, France formally colonized the island and continued using it as a pirate hub. The French even hired pirates to help protect their interests in the Caribbean. But this pirate utopia wasn't going to last forever. As European powers started cracking down on piracy and asserting more control in the Caribbean, Tortuga's days as a pirate stronghold were numbered. By the late 1600s, European governments, especially France and Spain, were cracking down on piracy. The Treaty of Ryswick in 1697 officially handed the western third of Hispaniola to France. It was a shift towards colonization. The pirates' influence started to fade. But for a time, Tortuga was the epicenter of the Caribbean piracy. It was a place where buccaneers like Henry Morgan made their name by waging war against the Spanish Empire. In 1891, the Haitian Revolution kicked off. It was one of the most intense and violent uprisings the world had ever seen. Enslaved Africans in Saint-Domingue had finally had enough. They were inspired by the French Revolution's talk of liberty and equality, and wanted the same. Saint-Domingue was the wealthiest colony in the Caribbean at the time. Its sugar and coffee plantations had made France a fortune. But it was built on the backs of enslaved people living in horrible conditions. The movement was led by a couple of main characters. Toussaint Louverture and Jean-Jacques Dessalines were two of the most significant. The war lasted decades, and it was chaotic. The French, British, and Spanish all wanted a piece of the action. Alliances shifted constantly. Louverture, a former slave, stepped up as one of the key leaders. He was a sharp military strategist and a savvy politician. He was able to play the British, French, and Spanish off each other. First, he allied with the Spanish in 1793, and then he switched sides and allied with the French. And he managed to get support from the U.S. and President John Adams. At one point, he even controlled parts of the eastern side of Hispaniola, which was under Spanish rule. But his ultimate goal was to abolish slavery. In 1801, he wrote up a constitution that did just that. Oh yeah, and it also made him governor for life. Napoleon didn't like this constitution very much, and he invaded. Back to war with the French. In 1802, Louverture was partially betrayed by his fellow freedom fighter, Jean-Jacques Dessalines. Louverture and his closest allies were captured and deported to France. Louverture died in prison before any trial. Dessalines then switched back to freedom fighting after his brief alliance with the French after realizing they had no intention of abolishing slavery. He then led one of the most successful military campaigns any subjugated people have ever fought against their subjugators. In 1804, Dessalines declared Haiti's independence. He became the emperor of Haiti. It was the first black republic in the world and only the second independent country in the Western Hemisphere after the U.S. But it did come at a cost. The fighting had torn the colony apart. Haiti's economy was in a bad way. France and Napoleon wanted huge reparations for losing its wealthiest colony. The new nation was crippled by debt. Dessalines leadership style wasn't great either. In 1804, he ordered the execution of all the remaining colonists in Haiti. In 1805, he drafted a constitution that forbade all white colonists from owning property or land in the country. It was a hard reaction, but can you really blame the guy? Still, though, even his allies started to hate him. His economic policies were harsh. He forced his people to either serve as soldiers or work as laborers on the plantations to help boost the economy. A lot of people felt as though they'd gone right back to being slaves again. So in October of 1806, he was assassinated by members of his own inner circle. It's always the ones you think you know. Haiti was dealing with all this drama. While that was happening, the eastern part of Hispaniola stayed under Spanish control. But Spain's grip was weakening thanks to the Napoleonic Wars. This gave Haiti an opening. Jean-Pierre Boyer became president of Haiti in 1818. He saw a chance to reunify the island. By 1820, he invaded the east and kicked out the remaining Spanish authorities and declared himself the ruler of the entire island. But Boyer's reign wasn't smooth. While he managed to control the whole island politically, his efforts to unify the two very different parts of Hispaniola fell flat. Boyer imposed heavy taxes and forced land reforms that mainly hurt wealthy landowners in the east. He even expelled most of the white population except for a group of Polish settlers who had fought with the Haitian revolutionaries. 
To top it off, Boyer had to pay France an indemnity to get international recognition for Haiti, which only worsened the already fragile economy. Culturally, the eastern part of the island wasn't on board with Boyer's rule. Many people there had strong ties to Spain and saw themselves as completely different from the Haitians. They resented losing their land and rights under Boyer's policies, and that tension kept growing. By 1843, a revolution forced Boyer out, and in 1844, the Dominican Republic declared its independence. That was it. The island was permanently divided, and it has stayed split between Haiti and the Dominican Republic ever since. Haiti and the Dominican Republic were kind of fallen apart by the early 1900s. Political chaos, financial disasters, I mean, it was bad all around. But Haiti had it worse. Haiti was stuck with that massive debt to France, basically paying for the privilege of no longer being a colony. By the start of the 20th century, Haiti was completely broke. It had taken out loans from American banks and they couldn't pay them back. So the U.S. decided to step in. The official story? Help Haiti pay its debts and bring stability. The real story? Protect American interest. So in July 1951, U.S. Marines stormed into Haiti. President Woodrow Wilson didn't want European powers getting involved. Really though, he didn't want Haiti's financial collapse to mess with U.S. business. The situation was already explosive. Haiti's president up to this point was a guy named Vilbrun Guillaume Sam. But then he was assassinated. He was dragged out of the French embassy and literally torn to pieces by a mob after he ordered a mass execution of political prisoners. The U.S. used the chaos as an excuse to invade. They said it was about restoring order, but it was really about resources and controlling those. Once the Marines had boots on the ground, they didn't waste time. They took over Haiti's customs houses. They took over its financial institutions. They basically took over the whole economy. Then they rewrote Haiti's constitution, removing a clause that had kept foreign companies from owning land. That opened up the floodgates for American businesses to come in and scoop up Haitian resources. They even implemented a forced labor system, making Haitians work on roads and public projects. All of this didn't go over well. Resistance flared up like the Kako Revolt in 1919, which the U.S. military crushed hard, killing thousands in the process. And things were not going over well in the Dominican Republic around this time, too. The pro-American government in the DR was overthrown just a year after the U.S. invaded Haiti. The U.S. couldn't let that slide. In 1916, they occupied the Dominican Republic, too. American troops landed in Santo Domingo and took control. They claimed they were there to restore stability and make sure debts were repaid. But again, it was all about protecting American investments, this time mainly in the sugar industry. In both Haiti and the DR, the U.S. occupation came down to one thing, control. American officials ran the show, making decisions for both countries, and local leaders were sidelined. On the surface, things looked stable, but under it, resentment was building fast. The people knew the countries were being treated like chess pieces in America's game, and while there were uprisings, none of them stood a chance against the U.S. military. Then came the rise of Rafael Trujillo in the Dominican Republic. During the U.S. occupation, Trujillo was groomed to take power, and when he did, it got ugly fast. Trujillo's regime, with its U.S. backing, massacred thousands of Dominicans. Even though this happened after the U.S. officially left, it was all set in motion by the political occupation and the political games that came with it. The U.S. finally pulled out of the Dominican Republic in 1924 and Haiti in 1934. They left behind a mess. In Haiti, the occupation left the country in even deeper economic and political trouble. The constitution they rewrote? Oh, it stuck around. The financial control? That didn't go away anytime soon. And in the DR, the seeds for Trujillo's 30-year dictatorship were firmly planted during the occupation. He was their guy, and he ruled with brutal force. Even after the U.S. left, the island of Hispaniola stayed divided. Haiti kept spiraling under the weight of debt and political instability, while the Dominican Republic saw economic growth, but at the cost of living under Trujillo's iron fist. Today, the two countries are still separated, not just by a border, but by their long histories of foreign meddling, exploitation, and conflict. Thanks for watching. What other colonial freedom fighters do you want to learn about? Let us know in the comments. And don't forget to like, subscribe, ring the bell, share this video with a friend, and all that good stuff to stay up to date on all the nutty stories from human history.